The Secret Power of French Literature By the time I was in the fourth standard, I'd already earned my parents a visit from the headmaster. It was evidently not a social visit, and I was dragged protesting into their presence so I could hear what he had to say. Headmaster threw a complete googly. He summoned me to his side and stroked my head in a most benign manner, even going so far as to put his arm around my lean shoulders as I wriggled anxiously under its weight. He informed my parents that I had outgrown what the school had to offer. My parents looked sternly at me. My mother's eyes made it clear that I should wait till he left and she'd teach me to outgrow anything in such a callous manner. I was terrified. I had no idea what I'd outgrown. It took a while for the three of us to understand it wasn't a complaint, but a compliment. He felt it his duty to advise my parents to make better arrangements for my schooling since the village school simply couldn't cater to my intelligence, which was a fortune not to be squandered. My mother immediately indicated I should leave the room. But now I had no desire to, so I hid myself in a dark corner listening to every word. They thrashed the topic to and fro with Papa saying he couldn't possibly send a ten-year-old, that to a girl, away to a boarding school as he suggested. I didn't know whether to cry or be happy. It was true that school was boring, but the thought of leaving home was inconceivable. Headmaster had come armed, for he didn't leave until a compromise was hammered out and a school agreed upon in a city where we had some distant relatives. It was too frightening for me and I bawled out from my corner that I didn't want to go. Which earned me no sympathy from my parents. If I had gone and got myself so intelligent as to warrant a personal visit from headmaster, I would have to face the consequences. My tearful promises to be less intelligent were laughed at by headmaster, who fondled my head and told me I would love the new school and left, seeing as he'd got what he'd come for. Huh. My brothers were dead jealous of me, and I immediately offered a switch. But apparently, that was unacceptable too. I don't know how things were worked out or what financial arrangements were made, but I landed up with the Sharmas. They had a daughter and a son, Sharanya and Sham, a few years older than me, and they became my second family. Headmaster was right. I enjoyed the studies, which made everything else easier. The Sharmas kept an open and happy home and their children's friends came often to visit. I made new friends and adjusted well. But as the years passed, I began to notice Sham's friends in a way my orthodox father had perhaps not anticipated. How could any girl not notice Harsh? Those magnificent pecs pressing against his white school shirt, his strong hands and his irresistible monobrow, they transported me and my insides melted in sheer delight. But Harsh was used to gooey-eyed girls and I doubted he knew of my existence. Sham and Harsh were preparing for their board exams and there were heated discussions about future options. Both were hoping to get into a college in the next town up from us. And I couldn't bear the thought of never seeing Harsh again and secretly wrung out many handkerchiefs with my tears. Not that that changed the outcome any. He went away and I was left nursing my broken heart. One evening, months later, Sharanya tossed me a letter. I usually received mail only from my family, but this handwriting was unfamiliar. I opened it and looked straight for the signature and was stunned to see it was from Harsh. It was a kind of 
love letter an i intend to love you letter i could barely hold the paper in my trembling hands he said he'd noticed me but had been too focused on the exams to start anything then at college he'd met a hundred girls but none of them could hold a candle to me that he'd spent months ruining his missed opportunity and finally decided to do something about it there was a lot of other stuff but that's as much as you need to know i carried the letter around with me for weeks not knowing what to say or do by which time i received another he said he realized he must have scared me off that he wasn't asking any commitment of me only wanted to be friends that threw me for another six i had no male friends except sham and he was theoretically a cousin and what a demotion love interest to friend i was shattered a few weeks on and i received another letter in the now familiar handwriting there was no mention of love or friendship in this one he described college and hostel life so many challenges everything was new and had to be discovered i read it many times and then stashed it with the other two every few weeks or few days in no predictable pattern another missive would arrive he wrote about his life the freedom to do whatever he liked but the responsibility he felt to use the opportunity and genuinely get an education something that didn't gel with the rest of his class he didn't have as much cash as some of them either and i felt his pain as he kept himself out of things he simply couldn't afford he wrote of how he thought i'd react to various things what subjects i'd love and which were just a bore which profs would nurture me and which i should avoid he told me which hostel i should apply for and to move heaven and earth to get in there I burned as I read that wondering how he'd acquired so much inside dope on girls hostels and seethed till I read the PS on the last page that he'd asked a classmate saying he was checking for a friend I'm sure he knew how easily he could play with my emotions He came back home on college breaks and visited Sham of course I never knew what to do with myself on those occasions I stayed in the shadows So I never actually spoke to him or he to me except through the medium of those letters but I thrilled and shivered and tingled with secret delight I never wrote back that would have been too bold but I saved all his letters and read them each a hundred times and worked hard for my board exams and my college applications always looking to the day I could be reunited with him I aced my boards as expected and easily got my choice of college and even my old fashioned papa agreed to let me stay in a hostel and soon i found myself in the big city with only one friend and a secret one at that the letters traveled with me of course in a pretty biscuit tin secreted carefully in my trunk the thought of actually being with harsh was almost too exciting to keep within me It burst out in unaccountable skips and hops that I seemed unable to control. We'd parted as almost strangers and would meet now as almost lovers. Harsh seemed undaunted by this chasm. He wanted to show me so many places and things and people to guide my selection, advise me on the best way for this and that, help me through all my doubts and difficulties. He stepped into the gulf of time as if it wasn't even there. He was a powerful force and I was swept along without a moment to think for myself. Whenever I turned around, there he was, if not physically, then in my head with his do this and don't even think of doing that ringing emphatically in my ears. The days flew by busy with exciting newness and Harsh organized every last detail for me. but i became more and more jumpy and irritable the old headmaster visited me in my dreams to remind me that my intelligence was a fortune not to be squandered 
I woke in the small hours of the night with my heart racing and my brow sweaty and the bed sheets twisted around me like chains and the thought of Harsh, big and bold and bossy, hovering like a genie at the foot of my bed. How can I justify my turmoil? Harsh has outsourced all my thinking and decision making to himself. He wants me to feel safe and secure, knowing he's thought deeply over the decisions he's making for me. He's warm and kind and generous in every conceivable way. But all this 360 degree cotton wooling is making me every day more shaky and underconfident in myself. His opinions are so loud, I can't hear mine. His views are so strong, I can't discover my own. He protects me and guides me through everything, even the things I don't need to be guided through. And it has left me feeling I can't find my own way. But this was what I wanted and yearned for. Last year, if I'd have known he'd pamper me to this extent, I'd have died of ecstasy. Instead, I'm mad with frustration. Everything seems horribly confused. Nothing is as it should be. It appears to be all roses, but I seem to tread only on the thorns. And I don't have a minute to figure anything out. I wanted Harsh's attention more than I can possibly say. And now that I have it, everything should be wonderful. But it's not. I'm so bewildered to say it's not. So I've retreated to the library to sort out my head. I've tucked myself into the quiet French literature alcove at the back that nobody ever goes into and I have a fat French book open in front of me. I don't know a word of French, of course, but I'm staring at this book and hoping it has magical powers to detangle the mess inside my head and help me figure out my own path. Oh, harsh, harsh, harsh!